welcome to my office. I used to work in places like this as a mountain bike guide, leading clients from all over the world through Scotland's epic landscapes and amazing trails. Things changed a wee bit for me in 2007. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which is a mountain biker's worst nightmare. Mountain biking and MS don't get on too well. I can't guide anymore, but getting to these places is as important to me as ever, probably even more so. I'm a champion for the charity Overcoming MS. And like them, I want the world to know that MS isn't necessarily a death sentence. And sometimes I need to look at life through other people's eyes to find the extra insights and perspectives that I need to get me out of the, of the holes that I sometimes find myself in. Small in stature, but mighty in so many ways. In this episode, I'm meeting a pocket rocket from the world of mountain biking. Katie Winton's a true force of nature. She's been at the top flight of enduro mountain biking for over a decade. But despite Katie's infectious optimism and drive, she was only now coming to terms with something that's challenged her throughout her entire life. Her brain is wired differently. She processes information differently. She organizes a life and sometimes this organises very differently from many of us. Katie's neurodiverse. She has dyslexia. Dyslexia is as unique as a fingerprint and every affected individual experiences it in their own way. Let's dive into Katie's story and find out what dyslexia means to her. Katie and I, when we ride together, it's generally like chatting for the whole time we're out. We'll be talking about some really profound life thing when we're like, oh my God, like we'll have really just touched on something and then it'll be like gloves on, right, okay, good go. How she deals with life. She's so emotionally matured and in touch with herself and she's like easily 10 years ahead of me in terms of like how she is as a human. So who's really fastest? No, 100% <laughs> all day long. <laughs> Emma just catches me by surprise often though. No. <laughs> Slips with the brakes, full gas, off she goes. In gullies particularly. Loves a gully. <laughs> The difference between my like race mindset and my going out just riding with Emma, riding with my friends kind of mindset is just a different kind of intensity. You know, racing is an all on but also an all off because you're in a total flow state. You're just trying to hand over to everything you already know and just let yourself ride. And this is like a, just, just the fun of it, you know? It's not, I don't have to get it right, you know? We're just riding trying different things, you'll go one way, I'll go another way, we're just having a really good laugh and yeah, it just, it's like a, a cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> this project was a very big deal for me becoming more okay with this because for so much of my life I was not okay with being dyslexic at all and didn't accept it as part of who I am. I remember getting asked, what's good about dyslexia? And I was just like, I don't know. I don't know because all I can see currently is all the ways that it's getting in my way, actually, and all the inconveniences it's causing me and the frustration. When you're at school, the only measure of you as a person is results, academically. Not are you a nice person, how hard did you try to do that, you know, 
you know, all the other stuff that make people good people, you're only measured on like, did you get that spelling right? Could you write that essay or not, you know? And so then you define yourself within those bounds, which isn't actually a measure, a, a, a truer measure of what you can be. Determined. From a very young age, she was determined, yeah. A driven personality is what you would describe, driven personality. From a wee tot as well, from being, you know, from pushing a bricks trolley along when she could first walk, um, she would, she would be able to walk forward and then she couldn't turn, if she couldn't turn around the corner, she would just be like, ah, ah, until somebody turned around and then she could keep going again. The only reason that we really found out about Katie having dyslexia was we had this girl who's lying in her bed crying at night. And you kind of got that thing as a parent, you're thinking, what's going on? Why is she so upset? Um, and it was to do with her progress in school. Because I didn't understand what was going on, it wasn't adding up. It was basically like I had a, a, an equation that didn't add up and I was like, they just tell you to work harder, so I'm working harder and I'm either still getting it wrong or not finishing it in time, then I get told, take that work home because you're not finished it in time, which is usually a punishment for the people that haven't paid attention or tried hard. And I was like, you tell me to work hard, I'm working hard, I'm still not getting it finished and I'm still getting punished. What is happening? Am I stupid? Like, am I stupid? Like, what is, what is this? You know, she would be crying and upset and I just and saying, I just don't know, there's just no bright side to my life, is one of the things she said. Well, it's, 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 it's really difficult actually, because, I mean, reliving all of this reminds us what it was like, but she was nine years and six months, and I remember going through to Stirling, and she had this, there was this psychologist guy, and he took her and did all these tests, he said, um, this is Katie, she is in the 97th percentile for this intelligence, but on this test, she's in the fifth percentile. Because she's up here, there, that means she can be right in the middle when she's in school. And that's why the school don't see anything. But he says, this is the reason she's having all these difficulties. Getting the diagnosis was really important for me because it helped that equation add up. It was like, okay, right, there's, some, there's actually something here that's getting in the way. You're gonna to have to work around. I just want you to be able to read and write like everybody else. And I was just like, this is unbelievable. You're just a useless human. Couldn't stand it. And then I would get go to the horse and I was good at that. Like I was good horse rider because this, <laughs> the same rules applied. I wanted to do a good job, so that's what I did. And then the same with bike riding. It was the first time I was like, when I put effort in, effort equaled a result that matched, you know? I was doing a little cross country races. I was like, the faster I go up this hill and the faster I get back down, and get around this, all this course, I'll do well. <laughs> I was just like, oh, I'm not a totally useless human. Like there's something I can actually do. So then I just immerse myself in that as like my, like a, a light for me as a youngster when I just was like, you're, go you're gonna amount to nothing at this rate. So then I was like, oh sweet. I can, well, I can ride bikes fast. <laughs> Mountain biking was my way out and it was a way of validating that I was actually okay despite all this other stuff that was going on. If I'm good at biking then I'm okay and so that fueled me through pretty much all my career. <laughs> this is 2017. <laughs> no, that's a pizza box. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a good year I believe. That was the best year of my life. So, so far. Oh, well, come on. 2017. You get so much more to look forward to, I bet. So what happened in 2017 that made it so good? Um, I got on the podium for the first time. Mm -hmm. But also, the main thing was I was just riding like I knew I could. Um, I also 
just was full YOLO. Like my work-life balance was amazing. Someone that doesn't doesn't know, hasn't experienced what that can be like, what have they got to look forward to? Just endless discovery, like an absolute freedom and that you'll be challenged in different ways and be able to realise you can rely on yourself in ways you didn't know. You figure stuff out, you get really good at problem solving. Oh, come on, let's see it. What's going on? How do you work out your, your schedule? I mean, organisation's a, a big part of what you do, so... Yeah, this is me planning my year. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> this looks completely normal to me because I have done this for a few years now, but this is actually how it looks in my brain. My year is a circle in reverse, anti-clockwise. The big boxes are weekends and the lines are during the week. Um, this one's been made because it's for the racing and stuff, so these blue boxes are the time them away on different trips. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest things for me personally, is organising, and it has been a really big thing for me to cover up because I am a professional, so that means a certain thing. You have to be a certain way, so you need to remember all your stuff, you need to be on time, and if you're not those things, then you're sloppy or you, you're careless, and that is not any of the things that I am, but it appears that way to society. And that's a big part of dyslexia that people don't often think, just think, oh yeah, reading, writing, spelling, that's it, bush, there you go, there's your wee box. But actually, it's the organisation side for me is a, a real rigmarole. Actually, it's given me a lot. I can see things in a different way to other people and actually that's a wonderful thing. And I can problem solve very quickly. There's connections that I make with certain things that are so quick that I surprise myself. There's definitely elements of my brain that work possibly better because of it. And I am accepting it more as myself and as part of myself. And actually this is making me better. The only time I've ever seen a manifestation, if you like, of her dyslexia was she was presenting some awards, but when I spoke to her afterwards, she was having like a bit of a meltdown because she was given stuff to read and I'd think there was more on top of what she'd already learned. She'd had to learn some stuff, but then there was a change of order or there was more things added. But when she spoke about it later, she was like quite stressed. Um, but like that on stage, she was just La like she was struggling but laughing about it so everybody else was laughing with her which I thought was just like that's a skill in it it's like just to be able to get up there on stage be underneath feeling like you're really having a issue and having a big problem bringing the whole audience with you in that moment most people would have just like became a smaller person in that but she was just like still her and yeah bringing everybody with her so I thought that was really cool. Part of your job is to share your story, your journey on platforms like Instagram. Was the uh, voice to text technology helping dictation on smartphones? Oh yeah, massively. Because oftentimes if you can't spell the word, you won't use it. But I'm like, oh, that's the word I want to use. So I'll just be like, blah, blah, whatever the word is, put it in and then it just spells it for me. And then it's just like that I can feel how much energy is not being used, you know what I mean? I'm just like, oh. My technique is write everything down and then rearrange it. So then it's like a puzzle. You put it together. Like I know what I'm trying to say and then I just put it together in a way. So like I'll have different paragraphs and I'll move it. I do this for emails as well. <laughs> it's a whole thing, like trying to get it right and put the puzzle pieces together. So even now as an adult, it's constant learning, knowing. My brother did a, a song in primary school and it was like something about friends and they were like F-R-I-E-N-D-S So now I know how to spell friends <laughs> Do you know much about support for dyslexic children currently? My second cousin, he's got dyslexia And it's like a thing at the school They're like yeah, we've got this crew, they're all dyslexic and that means this And it's like woo, dyslexia And I was just like what? 
I'm jealous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why was that not celebrated? You know what I mean? Like it's just looked at in a much more positive light. That would have shifted my whole experience, like my whole experience. That just being able to celebrate that and go, yeah, you got this thing. It's not going to change. It's just the same as your eye colour. You can't change it. You've got it. But this is what we're going to do to work with it. Boosh. Beautiful. <laughs> do you have any hopes or aspirations from sharing your truths? <laughs> this is where I'll cry. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Yeah, this is the difficult bit. No, I need to get it out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is just the, this is the reason that I'm doing it. Because... <laughs> this is what I needed when I was a young kid. What did you need to hear as a young kid? That it's going to be all right. You'll be okay. Like you will absolutely find a way. You're going to have to do a lot of trial and error and it's going to be painful and it's going to be hard. But things are getting better and there's more support out there and the more honest you can be about it, the more help you'll get and then the more you can progress with whatever it is that you're trying to do. Well, this is a quote that really hit home for me. Um, if you judge a fish by how well it can climb a tree, it will forever live its life thinking it's stupid. And I was like, yes, because I was defined by a school system that judged me on academic ability when I'm capable of so much more outside of that, which I think is true for a lot of dyslexic people. And a lot of people in general. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. <laughs>